Good afternoon, um, good evening, and good morning to our uh, participants and to our uh, audience around the world. My name is uh, Ben Cashor, and I want to welcome you to the uh, uh, really important webinar we're hosting today called Unpacking the New UN Panel Report on Climate Solutions. I am the Li Keqing Professor in Public Management, and I also direct the Lee Kuan Yew School's Public Policy Initiative on Environment and Sustainability. And I'm very pleased uh, to welcome, to discuss uh, this uh, new UN panel report uh, with three uh, wonderful guests who bring academic, applied, and practical knowledge uh, to these questions. Uh, today, our process will be, um, I'll give you a brief overview of what we're gonna talk about and why this is such an important panel. Uh, we'll then have Professor Navraz Dubash give an overview of, of the panel and its key highlights, followed by uh, uh, Professor Angel Shu, who um, will uh, respond to uh, uh, the um, presentation and give her own thoughts. And then we'll have um, uh, our third uh, speaker, um, uh, Jen Wei Heng, uh, who will then uh, give a practitioner perspective. But before um, we get into the presentations, I want to give you a brief overview, which is that, as many of you know, um, the climate crisis uh, presents the world's governments, uh, the world's peoples, and the world's environment with probably the most pressing environmental challenge uh, the world has ever faced. And while this is a daunting task, um, never before have governments, uh, the private sector and citizens now been working on viable solutions to make a difference in, uh, in this, on this really important problem. And the lead uh, UN body that coalesces scientists around this problem is called the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change or the IPCC. Uh, and it released uh, um, following uh, the Glasgow uh, uh, COP meetings last year, at least in April, its third and final report assessing the state of knowledge on solutions, on solutions uh, for mitigating climate change. And we're going to hear um, from our panelists that um, uh, there are two very unique messages. One is that this crisis is increasingly acute um, and action is needed to be swift and immediate. But likewise, uh, the range of policy innovations is quite um, uh, important and accelerating uh, with the intention uh, that has been given and the ideas that are being put forward. So what does this all mean then for the ability of governments and citizens and the private sector to actually act and make a difference? To um, assess these questions, our uh, three panelists, our first Professor uh, Navraz Dubash, who um, acted as a coordinating lead author um, for uh, chapter 13 on national and subnational policies and institutions for this assessment report. And he also serves on the United Nations uh, Environment Program's GAP Reporting Steering Committee and has been a member of the Scientific Advisory Group for the UN Climate Action Summit since 2019. His CV is long, uh, and um, uh, you can uh, browse his website for details, but I do want to highlight that he's also uh, become an adjunct professor in our very own Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. And I'm very grateful that he's now you know, in, our, in our community. Our second speaker uh, uh, following now Rose's presentation will be Professor uh, Angel Shu, who helped author not one, but three of the chapters in this assessment, including those um, on urban uh, challenges, national and subnational policies, institutions, um, and as well as mitigation pathways. She is now um, assistant professor of public policy and the environment at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And she is founder and principal investigator of the data-driven lab. Uh, she's also been extensively involved uh, with Yale and US College having, having uh, been a professor there and also a graduate of Yale's uh, Environment School where we first met uh, many uh, years ago. Finally, 
Um, after Angel speaks, we'll be, we'll be turning um, for a response and thoughts to Mr. Jen Wei Heng, who was actually in Glasgow um, uh, this past fall and is the director of the Policy and Planning Division at the National Climate Change Secretariat Strategy Group uh, under the Prime Minister's office in Singapore. He leads the policy and planning team uh, to direct efforts across the Singapore government uh, to develop and implement Singapore's response to climate change and advance Singapore's interests on the international stage. So as you can see, we have got an amazing group to discuss this uh, report. Uh, the mission is important, the time is ticking, and these kinds of conversations are critical to advancing the climate agenda. So with that, I uh, welcome uh, uh, Professor Navroz Dabash to begin um, his presentation and our, our webinar. So welcome. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Kashor. I'm so grateful to be here as part of this um, uh, part of this panel. I am delighted to be with uh, Professor Angel Su and uh, with Mr. Jan Wei Heng. I think it's a wonderful uh, panel, and I look forward to hearing from our from our colleagues uh, as well. Uh, I'm going to try and be as brief uh, as I can, and it's my task to present a very complicated report as pithily uh, as I as I as I can do so. Um, and I'm going to take maybe uh, about 15 or 20 minutes with your permission to do that. Um, so just to give you a little bit of a flavor of what the, uh, of how this process worked. Uh, this was a report that includes many, many authors um, in, in almost 300 across 65 countries from both developing and developed countries. Um, and we reviewed collectively on the order of 18,000 scientific papers and got about 60,000 review comments back uh, from, from various people. Uh, so this was quite an effort over the last three years. What, was the key, what were some of the key messages that came out of this report? So the bad news story in a sense, and something we've unfortunately become de de uh, depressingly familiar with is that emissions continue to grow and are now at the highest levels in human history. Uh, we have spent most of the carbon budget required for about a 50-50 chance to stay below 1.5 degrees. And this graph shows you this continue, continuing uh, trend of emissions growth. Now, it is true that in some sectors, emissions are growing at a decreasing rate, which is the good news, moderately good news. But we are by no means, have we, no, we by no means turned the corner uh, as yet. And in fact, emissions in 2019 were about 12% higher than they were in 2010. Uh, so what does this mean for what we have to do in the future? Well, if you look at this graph, and this is a very standard way of representing the task ahead, the orange line shows us where we are trending and the various three lines below show us different possible trajectories of where we have to get to, depending on whether we start now, whether we start later, whether we aim for two degrees or 1.5 degrees, so you can see that these are actually, uh, the task before us is, is substantial. The, 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 the wedge be between the orange lines and the other lines are, are substantial. And there's been a lot of, lot of policy conversation about reaching 1.5 degrees. Well, to reach 1.5 degrees, we need to, the report says, we need to peak emissions before 2025 and reduce by 43% by 2030 getting to net zero emissions, that is emissions minus the uptake of emissions by things like forests, uh, have to reach zero by the early 2050s. If we want to aim for two degrees, we need to peak uh, also before 2025, still reduce by a lot, about a quarter by 2030, and aim to reach net zero by the early 2070s. So the bottom line really is that unless there are immediate and deep emission reductions across all sectors, 1.5 degrees now is really beyond reach. But I think the, me the, the message of the report is a little bit more nuanced. What the report says is, and this is the subtext really, it says, look, perhaps we shouldn't be obsessed about 1.5 versus 1.6 versus 1.7. Clearly 1.5 is better than 1.6, which is better than 1.7. What's important is that we start now. And we have to not only reach net zero by the second half of the century, but we need to turn the emissions curve starting today. 
So what are, what are the options available to us? And here we have slightly more of a good news story. So this graph, somewhat complicated graph, looks at the emissions reductions potential in a range of different sectors across energy, land use, buildings, and so on and so forth. And what's interesting is that where you have a blue portion of the graph, these things can be done at net benefits. And where you have the orange part, there are some costs, but they're not very high. And as you get to the red part, the costs are greater. And so if you look across this graph, the summary message is that looking at technology and looking at implementation considerations, we can cut emissions by 2030 by about half at under $100 a ton. And in fact, we can do about a half of that or a quarter of the emissions reductions at under $20 a ton. So there's an awful lot that can be done at under $20 a ton or even with net cost savings, right? So there's quite a lot that can actually be done. And the, uh, the big change since the last report, of course, is in the costs of renewable energy. So you can see these curves here that show that for photovoltaic, uh, uh, photovoltaics and for battery technologies, costs have fallen on the order of 85% over this last decade. And for onshore wind, it has fallen about 55%. So this is actually kind of the harbinger of an energy revolution. The question is, can societies take full advantage of this? And many are trying, but we are only at the early stages of making progress uh, in terms of adoption of these technologies. What then is the kind of summary message of, of where we are and where we have to get to? And I'm gonna give you sort of a two part summary message before moving a little bit deeper into the solutions. The headline here, uh, and I've highlighted this in yellow, is that global GDP uh, will continue to grow if we take on board a lot of these emissions reduction pol policies, but will be a few percentage points lower in 2050 if we limit warming to 1.5. And by a few percentage points, what the models suggest is that about a tenth of a percentage point decrease in annual growth, which would lead us to somewhere between two and a half and four percent less GDP in 2050. So not two and a half to 4% per year, only 0.1% per year. So we would be about two and a half to 4% poorer by 2050 uh, if we implemented all these policies. But this is actually kind of a somewhat confusing message and it's hard to fully absorb because of the first part of the sentence that I also want to draw your attention to. That number about 1% reduction rate of reduction per year, which is not actually very big, uh, it's well within the noise of normal sort of uh, turbulence, does not take into account the economic benefits of climate impacts. In other words, if you look at the avoided impacts, that more than compensates for that 0.1% reduction or 2.5% uh, decrease in, in global GDP in 2050. And it doesn't take into account the other opportunities opened up by climate action. And so this is a bit of an artifact of how these models are done because it's complex enough to come up with the numbers on, on, on uh, the GDP loss without factoring in these other things. So we have to look at what the possible opportunities are in terms of competitiveness, as well as the avoided damages. And when you do that, you see a somewhat different story, right? The story that we hear is that when you shift development pathways towards sustainability. And this is a very interesting idea this report has come up with. If we shift development pathways towards sustainability, then we actually have a broader portfolio of available mitigation actions and a broader portfolio of mitigation responses that we can think about. And also, if we are to achieve sustainable development, we have to both mitigate and adapt. And we have to do both these things uh, because if we don't, mitigate, that is, if we don't reduce emissions, we don't have it within our capabilities to adapt sufficiently to a world of three, four, five degrees. But if we don't adapt, we will also fall short because we are already locked into at least one and a half degrees. So we have to both mitigate and adapt if we want development. But if we rethink our development, then we can actually broaden the portfolio of available options. It's not just about renewable energy here and energy efficiency there there's a broader set, a set of things we can do. So what are some of those broader uh, things we can do? Right? Before I get into that, I just want to 
re-emphasize this phrase. How do we shift development pathways towards sustainability? So climate policy is not just narrowly energy policy. It's about broader development policy in both the developed North as well as the developing South, right? So one of the things that this report looks at that past reports have not looked at is the options on the demand side. How do we use energy? Uh, and how do we use, um, how do we, what are our use patterns that result in greenhouse gases, including agriculture and so on and so forth. And this looks at not just technology, but infrastructure, technology and behavior and how these things reinforce each other. And what the report finds is that these demand strategies by 2050 could reduce emissions by 40 to 70%. And what do we mean by demand uh, strategies? It means, how do we create jobs? How do we uh, build our cities? How do we build our transport networks? Uh, and what then are the resultant patterns of demand that we see uh, uh, arising from that? So an interesting phrase the, the report uses is choice architectures. The way that choices are presented could impact uh, things like the food sector and diets, uh, food waste, and as well as transport choices and therefore energy choices. So the bigger picture is how do we how do we construct the choices before citizens using both infrastructure, technology, using all three rather infrastructure, technology, and behavior, right? Uh, the second kind of complementary message is that many mitigation actions also have strong synergies with the SDGs, with the Sustainable Development Goals. So I've just pulled out a slice here where one looks at uh, the, uh, uh, the urban sector, particularly salient, of course, to Singapore, but, but of course, many other uh, parts of the world as well. And if you look here in this, in this particular diagram, all the pluses represent synergies. The minuses represent trade-offs, of which there are very few in this example. And the dark blue represent things where the confidence level is particularly high. So if you look, for example, at the highlighted row on urban green and blue infrastructure. So we're talking about things like green roofs, green facades, networks of parks and open spaces, wetlands, urban agriculture, and so on. These not only store and therefore help uh, store carbon and therefore help with mitigation, but they also achieve many other sustainable development goals. As you can see on these squares on the graph, they can help reduce pressure on urban sewer systems, reduce flood risk and heat island effects, deliver health benefits from reduced air pollution and so on. So the, the message here is that by rethinking what is climate mitigation and constructing it as your choice of development future, you can both achieve development and promote SDGs as well as uh, uh, improve mitigation outcomes. Now, I don't want to make this overly rosy. This isn't always the case. And there are cases in other examples in the report where you may not see quite so many pluses, you will see a few minuses as well. That doesn't mean that doesn't, one doesn't pursue those things, but you proactively try and manage uh, for the negative effects as well. But the good news is there are many more positive, uh, that is synergies, than negative, that is trade-offs, right? Um, so I'm then going to turn to what the report says about the realm of action around laws and policies addressing mitigations since uh, the uh, fifth assessment report, the shorthand for which is AR5. So what we see is many, many countries have actually put in place laws now that directly target emissions. And in fact, 53% of emissions are now under such laws in various countries. Uh, and these such laws are in place in 56 countries. And that's what this, this graph, uh, particularly on the left shows you, the graph, the right-hand side of the graph shows you that, that this is not just in one or two regions, it is in most regions of the world. And Asia is actually, the Asia Pacific region is actually in the, in the lead uh, in, in, in terms of uh, uh, promoting new laws uh, around climate change. What's also important though, when you think about the framework of laws is that so-called indirect laws, laws that may have been passed for other regions, land use change laws, energy efficiency laws, renewable energy promotion laws, and so on, or even food consumption, uh, laws that govern food consumption and food production. These indirect laws are also extremely important. And in one database, there were 690 such laws that indirectly impact emissions.
So what laws do is they give you a legal basis for action, they give you a platform for setting targets, they give you regulatory certainty, and they help create specialized agencies. Now, many countries do these things without laws, but laws have the benefit of providing an overarching framework, sending a signal to business and citizens, and making it harder to backslide. So many countries have gone down this, uh, gone down this road. Now, a second aspect of, 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 of governance around climate change is whether or not countries have institutional solutions to very big governance challenges that, if not unique to climate change, are certainly exacerbated in the case of climate change. So one of them is just coordination, right? Climate change cannot be pigeonholed within one sector, but most governments are organized around sectoral silos, right? So you need a coordination structure that allows you to look at the linkages between, say, the energy sector and the renewable energy transition, what it means for transport set, uh, networks, which are increasingly moving to electric vehicles, what it might mean for the building sector, which might get integrated with the electric vehicle transition through battery uh, 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 charging networks, right? So you need an integrated view increasingly. And how does that happen? So uh, in China, for example, they have uh, given a lot of authority to their National Development and Reform Commission, which is mandated with performing this coordination role. Kenya has a climate change council that does something uh, similar. So countries are finding solutions to this, to this problem. A second uh, challenge is strategy setting. Countries have to chart a course over time. As the earlier slides showed, we don't have a lot of time for this. So how does one set a knowledge-based strategy and do the analysis to understand where climate and development go together and where they may actually uh, conflict? So the UK is an interesting case here where they've established a climate change commission. In another context in my work in India, I've advocated such a commission for India, but not focused on climate change per se, but on low carbon development transitions because the context is different perhaps for a developing country. Another governance task that is required is to build consensus because we're talking about massively disruptive changes. If you're moving from the internal combustion engine to the um, uh, uh, electric vehicle, well, what happens to industries uh, in countries that depend very heavily, perhaps? Germany is an example where they have an extremely large and powerful auto industry. How do you bring them along so that they don't become uh, opponents of that, of that change, right? So you need bodies that help bring that uh, consensus uh, aspect to this. And we have examples. Uh, we have a just transition commission in several countries. We have a presidential commission on climate change in South Africa. We have a, a long-standing Brazilian forum on climate change. All of these are meant to build consensus around transitions. It's very important to note that these are all extremely challenging things to do. And so capacity constraints are a real problem in many countries. How do you build the ability to make these uh, long-term changes, to think in an upstream way, and so on? So deliberate attention to the governance challenge is one of the things the report suggests. And here are sort of some both examples of what countries have done and an illustration of the sorts of problems we need to try and solve. Of course, all of this doesn't happen at the international or the national level. And this is in particular speaking to uh, Professor uh, Angel Sue's work. Um, a lot of countries do a lot of climate action at the subnational level. That might be cities, that might be states or provinces in subnational uh, contexts. And I'm sure she'll speak more about this. But subnational action is important because it's often a source of experimentation. And subnational jurisdictions have jurisdiction over key areas of climate governance. Uh, so agriculture, uh, urban planning, these are things that typically are not governed at the, at, the, at the national level. For the first time, the report also gets into talking about, in a sense, political considerations, right? So in many countries, climate governance is constrained by structural factors, such as geography. If you have a lot of fossil fuels, maybe that's a, a more of a challenging context. If you are a city state and, a, and an island like Singapore is, that shapes how you would approach uh, this issue. The nature of your political system matters. So German, Germany has often been feted for having a system that allows the emergence of green parties, while the US has a system that has many so-called veto points, which can uh, uh, provide obstacles. 
Um, but this is but but this sort of geography and systems are not destiny. You can change that, and countries and societies do change that through political mobilization, through changes in the nature of media coverage, and so on. Let's shift very quickly, and I just have a couple more slides here to the policy space. We have seen this startling increase in policies across sectors uh, and all types of policies, regulatory policies, market policies, and so on. And it is very hard to assess how well they've worked, but there has been a limited set of studies that suggest that so far, the policies and laws put in place have decreased the annual emissions by about six gigatons per year, which is about a 10th of annual emissions. Now, that's a pretty big number, but it's certainly not enough for where we have to be. And this may be an underestimate, but that's, that's the ballpark uh, estimate that we can uh, come up with uh, scanning the, the, the evidence. We find regulations have been very effective at the sector level. Carbon pricing, it now covers about a 10th of emissions, but pricing by itself, given low levels of carbon prices in most countries, won't get you to where we have to get to. We need either higher prices or complementary mechanisms or both. And a really important message is that the landscape of climate policy has shifted from thinking about things like cap and trade or taxes to thinking about policy packages and economy-wide instruments. And I just want to illustrate that by the slightly complicated diagram that I will quickly take you through. If in the past, climate policymaking was focused on the top left box of this diagram, where you think about how you put in place incentive structures to enhance mitigation, such as carbon taxes, right? Um, uh, in a sense, the conversation has moved to the right and downwards, where when you move to the right, you look at a lot of developing country contexts that said, well, we're not going to focus just on mitigation. We want to focus on co-benefits, air pollution, and so on and so forth. But if you convert that into a more dynamic frame where you're looking at transitions over time, then you're having a conversation about what are called social technical transitions. How do you move, for example, to a renewable energy future? And then you would look at a policy package, not just to incentivize renewable energy, but to also accelerate the phase out of coal. Or if you look at the bottom right, you might be looking at system level transitions around sustainable urbanization, around green industrial policy, and so on and so forth. And to achieve the bottom half of this diagram, you really have to be in the realm of looking at policy packages rather than individual policies. The final slide, and I realize I'm a minute or so over, so I'll be quite quick here, is that it's very clear this is going to take money. And the IPCC report puts this very squarely on the table that overall, globally, uh, we are about if you look at the money flows now versus the money flow is required in 2030, at a global level, we're four to six percent, uh, uh, I'm sorry, four to six times, that's 400 to 600 percent less in terms of the current flows uh, as compared to what is required by 2030. So we are several multiples below where we need to be. And this multiple is even higher for the Asian region. It's two to, uh, well, it's two to four times less, but in absolute terms, it's much bigger. For South Asia, where I am from, it's seven to 16 times less uh, than we need to be. So this is a little bit of a sobering note. We need to find ways of mobilizing multiples more uh, finance if we are going to accomplish these transformative policy packages uh, around which a lot has been written, including uh, here uh, in our own uh, NUS, one of the leaders actually in, in some of the writing uh, in this area. So I'll stop there and hand it back to uh, Professor Kashor uh, and very much look forward to comments from the discussants. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Debash, for that uh, really wonderful and important overview of a very scientific and, and, and deep report on these issues. And it sets the stage our, our, our conversation. So with that, and um, I'll turn it right over now to uh, Professor Angel Shu, and we also appreciate her getting up so early in the morning. Uh, she's in North Carolina for this uh, really important uh, uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ben, and thanks so much to Navraz for an incredibly clear overview of the IPCC.
Um, so I have five minutes to be very brief, and I wanted to touch on four of the points that Naraz made. So hopefully I can do that efficiently. Um, I think the, the number one takeaway for me in Naraz's presentation and this chapter or this um, full, I guess, um, section of the IPCC was the message to national governments. There's a much clearer emphasis on the imperative for governments all around the world to move away from fossil fuels and to make immediate greenhouse gas emissions reductions now, not waiting another decade or until mid-century across all sectors. So I think the imperative is really clear. And one point that I would love for Navras to give us a peek under the curtain is the fact that many of these scenarios actually de-emphasize carbon capture and sequestration. So in the previous assessment report, many of the scenarios relied very heavily on these technologies, either direct air capture or removing carbon from the atmosphere and storing it underground. And so many of those scenarios, particularly those that got us to that 1.5 degree scenarios, relied on these technologies. And I think in the last decade, what we've seen is that these technologies, and that was very clear on the bar chart that Naraz showed with the different colors of red and blue, you could see that most of those carbon capture technologies are still very much in dark red. So between 100 and 200, in some countries, over $300 per ton to capture those emissions and store them underground. And so we haven't yet seen that scaling up and that development that I think these technologies promised a decade ago. And so I, I for one, was really, happy to see that there was less emphasis on these technologies that are frankly still very expensive and not affordable for many countries to implement and on the emphasis that we have the solutions we have the technologies today in the form of renewable energy that Naraz that that statistic that you said less than twenty dollars a ton to implement today I think that's an incredibly powerful message for governments to hear and then that's a segue into my second point which is that the economics are very clear now for decarbonization and that's something that this section of the IPCC makes very clear for national governments. And so uh, the falling technology costs for both solar and wind are now making these technology options much more affordable. And I think one of the points in the summary that really stood out for me is that the, the um, authors say it actually may be more expensive to maintain emissions intensive energy systems than to actually transition to low energy in low emission systems for some regions and sectors. I thought that was an incredibly powerful message that was highlighted as part of the summary. And, and so one question for Navraz, as you were presenting, I thought what was really interesting is the shift away from, I'm thinking about in 2004 when Sir Nicholas Stern released the Stern Report and talked about the economic costs and the damages of climate change. And, and, and then they were, it was very much the message to policymakers of gloom and doom and that if we don't do anything on climate change, it's all gonna be impacts and costs and damages. And I thought what you highlighted really well was the opportunity for governments to take advantage of the, um, the, the growth in green jobs and green economy and all of the opportunities economically and the benefits that can result if we shift now on these low carbon decarbonization pathways. And so that was something that was, that was really striking to me. But one question for you, Navraz, and, and perhaps to also to Mr. Hung, is how can we understand where those benefits could be distributed? And how can we make sure that these benefits are not just benefiting global north and developed countries, but that those benefits are being distributed equally across the world. And so I think that was something I'd love to hear uh, you touch on, um, or, or both of you touch on, because I think that's a major question, is that to ensure as we transition and decarbonize economies, and you, and you spoke a little bit about this in terms of just transition and just transition commissions, on the part of institutions that can help to ensure that these benefits are distributed equally. But that's something that I'd like for us to discuss further as a panel. And then as, as Navraz um, rightly pointed to, I wanted to bring up the um, emphasis on the potential for cities and subnational actors and urban areas to contribute to global climate change mitigation. So for more context in the previous fifth assessment report of the IPCC, there was really only one chapter that was focused on human settlements and urban contributions. Now there are at least three, and I know that because I contributed to those on, on chapters four, eight, and 13, that talked about the potential for a all of society approach to address climate change. And so I think that's also really striking and talking about particularly for cities in the ASEAN region that are developing, urbanizing very quickly to, to right now be thinking about how to lock in lower forms of development through transportation infrastructure, how buildings in urban form are, um, are created. And so I think these are really important considerations. And certainly from the policy side, what we've seen in the last five years, close to a thousand cities have now set their own targets to decarbonize and to, and to set um, net zero goals for themselves. And I think that's really encouraging. 
And our research, and we reflected this throughout the chapters, is that not just subnational governments, but also businesses can lead to additional mitigation on the order of one to two gigatons per year. That's about 4% of global total emissions in 2030. So I think there's huge potential for subnational areas to increase their mitigation contributions, and then to also feed back into this ambition loop that the Paris Agreement started in 2015. So that was really critical, the idea that subnational and private actors can help to catalyze and raise the ambition of national governments to help us get and ratchet up the ambition of Paris goals over time. So that was something that this um, IPCC emphasized much greater than in previous uh, reports. And then I think the last part, and I think this is one of the most innovative chapters for the IPCC, and Raz touched on this as well, which is the focus on demand side responses. I thought this was really revolutionary for the IPCC, considering previous reports have really focused on the supply side. So how do we supply electricity to people in a lower carbon um, world and also focus on industry decarbonizing? But now the actual, I think this is the connection for, for citizens and for everyday people who feel that climate change is such an existential and really difficult um, crisis to tackle. And, and what can we do as people? I think that this is one chapter that really lays out very clearly. I think that statistic that you that you um, relayed to, to us, Navraz, the 50 to 80% of emissions across all sectors can be reduced just from human and demand side responses. And so I think uh, this is an opportunity for governments to establish what you refer to as choice architectures or incentives or nudges for citizens to really engage on the climate issue. So uh, incentives for electrifying their homes and adopting electric vehicles, putting uh, solar panels on their rooftops, shifting consumption patterns. And I think in the context of COVID-19, we've seen the difference it can make when we choose to stay at home and we don't necessarily commute to work. And I think this is an area where Singapore in particular really shines. And so if Mr. Hung can also comment on Singapore's efforts to also shift demand side responses, I think that would be really interesting. As one example, uh, when I was in Singapore living um, and working there for five years, there, I think in 2017, I went back to the US um, to complete a year of teaching and sabbatical at Yale. And then when I returned and at the end of 2018, they had eliminated all plastic straws <laughs> all across the board. So all of a sudden you could not get any plastic straws anywhere. And so at NUS, at any, at any cafeteria, they were no longer giving out plastic straws. And I thought that was a small example, but really powerful of the way that governments and, and also institutions like universities can really shift uh, consumer choices. And so that was just one small example. But I think that Singapore is a really ripe environment to demonstrate the ability to do this type of choice architecture because it has a, a workable scale where you can really implement these policies effectively. So I hope, uh, Ben, I stayed within my five minutes, but there was just so much great stuff that Navraz teed up for us in this panel. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much. That was a great um, response and also overview, not just of past reports, but also then the hope um, uh, about actionable ways to go forward, especially in the context, I think, in your questions of what um, Singapore can offer the world as well. And so with that, let us turn uh, first, before getting into a lot of your questions, uh, to um, Mr. Hang Jen Wei for his thoughts and reflections as well. So thank you so much. Thanks very much, uh, uh, Prof Ben. And, and, and maybe first I would want to congratulate uh, 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 Prof Navroz and uh, Prof Angel for the wonderful and very comprehensive uh, IPCC report. Um, I think uh, it paints a very comprehensive picture and also, uh, outlines the broad solutions I think the world can take on uh, uh, to, to address our climate problem. Um, I would say that, uh, at least sitting from the government side and, and interacting with other governments, um, I think global climate action is, uh, has picked up pace uh, significantly in the last uh, two years or so. Um, maybe I start internationally, then I come back to what Singapore is doing. So on the international front, one statistic uh, Singapore tracks is what we call the number of countries that uh, declare uh, net zero targets, um, just as a reflection of you know, how ambitious the world is. And, uh, and uh, um, if I recall correctly, there are about 84 or 85 countries to date that have declared net zero, and of which about a quarter of them declared net zero around or during COP26 in uh, Glasgow last year. So that gives a reflection of how how, how much momentum there is on, on climate action. Uh, the other point, the other statistic that we track is the number of businesses that uh, 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 pledge to uh, UN's uh, road to net zero uh, action. And when the campaign started in 2019, I think there were 
under 100 companies. And as of end of the last year, uh, more than 5,000, so 50 times, 50 fold increase. That, that just gives a reflection of uh, how much action there is around the world. And I think uh, the Glasgow Climate Pact, um, I mean, if you look at various reports uh, around, some, some say it's not super ambitious because you know we didn't meet our 1.5 degrees, we didn't uh, get $100 billion a year, but I, I think it, 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 it has a significant uh, impact. And I think um, when I speak to uh, my colleagues who have been to multiple COPs, uh, they say that uh, Glasgow really made a difference. Um, when they spoke to the various uh, negotiators from the other countries, um, everyone was trying to find middle ground and they are not you know, holding on to their country positions, but thinking of you know, what makes sense for the world. And I think that shift was uh, quite important in, 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 uh, in being able to close the Paris rule book at, uh, at Glasgow. Um, I would say that um, since uh, Glasgow, uh, there's been some hiccups, of course, around the world. Um, we all uh, have heard of the Ukraine-Russia war. And I think what's not quite clear is what the medium-term implications are. I think the short-term implications are quite clear-cut. I think when there's an energy crisis, uh, the, everyone is responding uh, with a, you know, uh, a fight or flight kind of mode, whereas what the medium-term implications are are not so clear at this moment. Um, and I think that's something we can discuss if, if, if there's interest. Um, I want to quickly switch gears and talk about Singapore uh, because I think that's really where, 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 uh, where, where I can contribute a little bit more. So Singapore, as is, uh, some of you might know, we, we contribute to only 0.1% of our global emissions. Uh, but the fact of the matter is we are affected by the other 99.9% .9 that we don't contribute. Um, this year at uh, budget in February, um, we have made a decisive shift towards a low carbon economy and we made two big policy moves. Uh, number one, uh, we raised our climate ambition to uh, get to net zero by or around uh, the middle of the century. And uh, second, we raised our carbon tax from five Singapore dollars today uh, to reach 50 to 80 Singapore dollars uh, per ton of carbon by, by 2030. And this is taken in steps but uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, this puts us at probably the highest carbon tax rate in Asia. Uh, and, and that is a reflection of um, um, what we are putting on as a price for externality in, in, for, 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 for carbon. So the question is why, why did Singapore make that, that shift of, of these two big policy moves uh, earlier this year? Uh, and I would say that Singapore has always placed uh, importance on the environment. Um, I mean, we pride ourselves as a garden city um, for our power generation, while we uh, rely, still rely on natural gas for, for, for a large part. Um, we have already phased out coal for multiple decades. So today, um, we have less, we have about 1% of, uh, of power generation being coal. If you look back at the statistics, you know, 20 years, 30 years ago, it is also about 1%. In fact, our coal share has not grown, uh, has, has not, has not, has not never high. Uh, and that's because we always believe in trying to be as clean as possible. But carbon has been a real challenge for Singapore. And the reason is because Singapore is an alternative energy disadvantage. Um, what does this mean? I mean, Singapore is a very small uh, city-state. We have uh, 700 over square kilometers of land. Our population density is um, um, 10 times denser than Korea as a, as a country. And this means that we have much less uh, renewable energy solutions and uh, decarbonization opportunities than many other countries. Uh, just using an example, solar energy, um, it's our only, only renewable energy source. And, and, and we have been putting it on you know, buildings, putting it on our reservoirs. But even when it's fully deployed by 2050, and that, that includes you know, certain plants depending on your technology, availability, etc. Even then, we, we, ex we, we expect it to make up less than 10% of our power needs. So solar, well, it's the best solution we have uh, in our pocket, um, our sense is, um, we'll still we will still need to depend on uh, uh, other countries for for our energy. Uh, that said, Glasgow did two things. Um, Glasgow did two things that uh, 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 made a difference to our climate policy that made us uh, rethink that it is indeed possible for us to get to net zero. Uh, the first is um, the, the 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 conclusion of Article Six, and Article Six, for those who do not know, is the uh, global rules on carbon markets. What this means when the rules are concluded is that uh, Singapore can now has now has the ability to assess the world's mitigation potential, and that's quite powerful because um, what was our 
primary disadvantage, which is the lack of mitigation, ability to mitigate our emissions, uh, now is overcome simply with uh, Article 6. Uh, and and, and, and I, I take the point that you know, we should not be overly reliant on uh, credit, and, and Singapore doesn't intend to be over reliant on credit. But our sense is we will probably need some credit to get to net zero, uh, given our um, constraints. Um, the next part is uh, that, uh, and I think this this is a point that uh, uh, both uh, uh, Prof Prof Navros and uh, Prof Angel briefly mentioned. Um, there's that colorful chart about you know the the cost of technology, and I would say that that graph is not static, and I think that graph changes uh, with time, and I uh, I I think if we look forward at you know how quickly the 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 those color sorry my lights went off sorry those the colored red those bars that are colored red will turn 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 blue i think um it will come sooner than later uh, and that's because uh, governments businesses uh the finance sector backing this are, are making large investments in these areas and with that investment it brings down the price and allows for uh deployability at scale uh, but this is really just why uh, 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 it's just why but this is really that whether we can get to net zero or not, but I think the 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 real question is why we why we decide to do this, and 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 I would say Singapore is a very we are very pragmatic when it comes to climate policy, uh, and and um I think as uh, Prof Prof uh, Navros and Prof Injo mentioned, the economics make sense. Uh, we have traditionally we as in Singapore government has tradi traditionally thought of uh, carbon as a as a constraint, carbon as a constraint to grow. Um, but I would say that um, this view is uh, increasingly needs to be increasingly challenged. I think it, it is indeed a constraint to grow for certain industries, but at the same time, being low carbon also uh, creates opportunities to enable uh, sustainable economic growth in other industries. And that's something that we should not uh, uh, underestimate. Um, you know, we always say that a bird in hand is worth two in a bush. I would say the green economy today is... Uh, no longer in the bush. I think it's here, it's here, and it's now. And and we should we should really make sure that we we look out for the opportunities in the in the in the horizon. Because uh, uh, as as I think uh, Prof Navros highlighted, even when we look at the 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 impact of on GDP of uh, of of getting to one point five degrees, there is that that part of opportunities that's not quite sized yet. And I think that side, that part is not small at all. So we should definitely be, be, be seriously looking at that because I think that is where, where, where it would make the biggest difference to whether a country or a, or a city or a company should go net zero or not. Um, uh, I was just going to say that um, notwithstanding all, all these you know, positives that I mentioned, uh, uh, it is not all, all, all uh, it's not, not a walk in the park to get to net zero. I think the, the, the challenges for transition are very real. Um, Singapore has an energy and chem chemical sector, um, you know, typically seen as Jurong Island, uh, but of course it's a bit larger than that. But um, really it contributes to 3% of GDP and 1% of jobs. Um, we can say that, you know, uh, it, you know it's, it's not that large, you know, can we, can, we, can we do something about it? I think the, the fact of the matter is, is, is 3% of GDP is not that easy to replace. 1% of jobs is 20,000 jobs, uh, 20,000 uh, Singaporean jobs. And these, uh, the, the energy and chem sector tend to pay better than some of the other manufacturing sectors. So it is not a straightforward case where we can immediately replace the jobs. And, and I would say um, at this current point in time, uh, uh, there is a possible pathway where the, the energy and chemical sector can be, become green as well. I think that's something that's, uh, not out of the realm of possibility at this point in time. So I would say uh, we need to look at what makes sense. Um, transition will be, any, any form of transition will be painful uh, and we need to make sure that um, not only do we, do we uh, replace the GDP and replace the jobs, but we also need to make sure that people who are inadvertently displaced from the transition needs to, needs to be placed somewhere and they probably are not going to fit into the new green jobs that are created. So they need to fit somewhere else in the economy. And I think it's the government's duty to make sure that, you know, uh, the transition is, uh, I think, uh, a fair one, as, as uh, uh, various people have said earlier. So I was going to stop here earlier, but I'm just reflecting on what uh, Prof Angel said. Uh, I was going to say that, you know, that where, how does Singapore then take this forward? Um, on the policy front, I think we are, we are moving already. Um, 
but on the on the on the engagement front, I think that's where there's uh, a lot more work to be done. Um, I think uh, Prof. Andrew said, you know, there's an all of society approach, and 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 in Singapore we have this uh, green plan, and which which is which is really a platform for us to engage the citizenry, and we see it as a whole of nation approach. We want um, a government, businesses, uh, individuals to all come together, and 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 ask the the question, you know, what does Net z- what does a net zero Singapore mean mean, mean to mean to me and, and and why should I go net zero? And I think once we can answer these questions, I think uh, we are able to rally the nation towards the common goal that we are all moving towards. Um sorry, I think I overran my time, uh, Prof Ben, but uh, I hope that's been helpful. Uh, very helpful. And I'm actually going to be playing this recording back to my students in future years. Uh, really helpful. Um well, in a moment. I'm going to turn it over to the uh, audience, uh, but I do want to make, make a comment and then ask a, a follow-up question to all of you um, on this really important conversation. The first is on uh, uh, Mr. Heng Jianwei's uh, last point about um, the people involved and the, and the livelihoods involved. Just a little plug. Um, when, we, um, when Dean Danny asked uh, for our school to initiate um, uh, uh, this effort on public policy and the environment. Uh, we developed a collaborative vision with stakeholders and uh, faculty. And one key theme out of that was that a key pillar in our new initiative will be uh, just transitions. And this is a common theme across the world now. How do we actually maintain and build in a way that's just for all people? So I, I want to reinforce that point, whatever happens, that's so important especially in the developing world. Um, now, but I, I do want to raise a question that's emerged among our panelists. I think a really fascinating question, and I see two themes I wouldn't mind responses to. So one is around the different kinds of technologies we ought to be focusing on. One thing that's clear, this report is huge. It's got all kinds of ideas for engaging opportunities, but it's also overwhelming. There's so many ways you can go. And so my question is, we have on the one hand, uh, uh, Prof. Angel Shu talking about, we already have the technologies uh, in play, wind and solar especially. But others are talking around, well, how do we actually improve carbon capture and storage? And, and by the way, in the context of Singapore, this means collab- collaborative governance with other nations in the, in the region uh, for the storage capacity. Um, and it also means developing hydrogen as a possible source and so on. So I'm curious about then, do we just stick to the technologies we have now? given they are the cheapest, which by the way, they weren't 20 years ago, but how do we think about then uh, that choice? Where do you come down on this choice, current or future technologies? And I would, I would point out that Singapore is a technological leader on so many of these things too. So I'm curious about these pathways, which way do you come down on this, where to go in these pathways? Uh, and then likewise on the policy instruments themselves, I'm hearing two themes, one is, uh, carbon taxes, uh, cap and trade has been replaced by a broader suite of policy patches. Prof uh, uh, Navarro's talking about this. But where do you come down then? Is it, do we not uh, place many eggs now in the tax carbon uh, and cap and trade budget? Uh, or do we go more for policy patches? Or how do we think about the two interacting with each other? So how do you all respond to these different pathways? What are the most um, potential and most impactful given the time that we have we have left. Um, let's begin in the order of the speakers. So first, uh, Prof. Uh, uh, Naraz. Uh, thank you. Thanks so much. I'll, I'll be brief because I, I've already had the lion's share of the, the, the time. So, I, but but and and let me sort of return back to the report. I think that the idea, uh, and I was very interested that uh, Mr. Mr. Heng mentioned that, you know that that colorful curve, that colorful graph will is a static one. That's true. Every five years, it gets updated. It's called the costs and percent potentials graph, and it'll be different, as you say, in a few years. But if we adopt the approach recommended in the report of thinking about transitions, right, in a sense, that helps square the circle. Because if you're thinking about transitions, and so this is your technology question, uh, 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 Ben, then for different kinds of transitions, you're at different parts of a transition curve, which often follows an S-curve pattern. You start slowly, you move steeply up the S-curve, and then it flattens out. So for wind and solar and so on, you're done with the technology part substantially. It's about uptake. Whereas for hydrogen or CCS, you're very much at the technology part. 
So that helps you also answer your policy question. So for wind and renewables and the energy transition, you're now thinking about uh, 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 revenue sharing mechanisms that uh, avoid losers getting hurt. You're thinking about behavioral changes that enable the uptake. Whereas for hydrogen and so on, you're thinking about technology deployment and technology development uh, uh, policies. So in both cases, uh, you would be using packages mm -hmm. and you'd be using combinations of things like, um, uh, like a tax or a cap and trade, but you would be complementing it. And what you'd complement it with depends on where you are in that transition stage, right? So in a sense, you, you have to, but you have to be clever about bringing all these elements together and thinking about the different requirements of different transitions. But it comes back to my point that this is much more complex policymaking. Right. And therefore, the, the capacity requirements are huge, which takes us back to the question I hope we come back to of the just transition questions, what happens to developing countries where these capacity shortfalls are, 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 are greater. And again, Mr. Heng's point that there are going to be disruptions. There are going to be some losers. And we have to proactively think about that as well. I'm happy to come back to that. Thank you. Just a quick plug too. Lee Kuan Yew School, as you mentioned, is one of the places in the world where policy packages policy Indeed. mixes has been really well developed uh, uh, in an applied way. So I'm, I'm glad to hear you make those points. Uh, over to Prof Shu. Um, I think, yeah, Navraz, you really, um, I think articulated it very clearly. I would just add in terms of the technologies to focus on one point, and you, you did briefly touch on this, but is the co-benefits. And so if you're a developing country, thinking about the mix of different technologies that you could adopt now to address climate change, also thinking about the air pollution co-benefits and the other societal economic co-benefits that can result when you adopt those renewable technologies or those approaches that are available right now that are low cost, as opposed to uh, investing in those technologies that still require a lot more development, as you said, are at the beginning of the S-curve. And so for me, that, that's, that makes it very clear. And then um, in terms of, Ben, your second question about policy instruments, um, yeah, I mean, I think exactly as Navarro says, it has to be a mix, but one piece that I think um, we can also think about, and you and I have had this conversation a lot, Ben, is, is also regulation. I think it also comes back yeah. to regulation, having national governments also take the lead and regulate. And so I study China um, at very closely. And so I think China, and, and I think to, to a large extent, Singapore also does this very well, is also thinking about engaging national governments and regulation to also set those very top level policy directives, those very clear economic and policy goals for subnational and business actors to then uh, achieve. So for me, that's also regulation is a really clear policy instrument as well. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the reasons why solar is so cheap now, right? Because regulation kickstarted that process. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, Mr. Heng Jianwei, how do you handle those questions? Yeah, thank, thanks. I think it was a very insightful question. I was just gonna answer on Singapore's perspective and I'll just talk a little bit more about carbon tax. So yeah. um, we we think carbon pricing is important because it's about right pricing externality. I know I, I know if I look at the, uh, uh, from Navarro's uh, two by two diagram, we are technically on the top left top left box, I think. But but I think the the ability to change uh, behavior is is in, in, important. So I would say that there are there are there are your 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 you know your your general businesses who may not be paying so much carbon tax to begin with, but carbon tax helps them put a price on what is carbon and helps them uh, look at the, the situation and helps them. Think of oh you know what should I then do uh, and 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 I would say um, very interestingly I was at uh, uh, a session with the Singapore Business Federation uh, last week and and these are all the various head of the the various uh, TACs um, from 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 various uh, sectors and and one interesting feedback I heard is that you know uh, the carbon the putting the carbon price there or raising the carbon price helps them think about how to move. To, into um, circular economy moves, how to decarbonize because now they know um, what the price tag is of, of, of emitted. And, and that is precisely the purpose of carbon tax, which is to, to, to write price that externality. Um, I think uh, looking at the current carbon prices, it's quite clear that uh, our current five, five Singapore dollars is, is on the low side. And I think with our uh, increased trajectory, our sense is that where we are landing at you know, 50 to 80 Singapore dollars by 2030, is about a fair price. It's about a fair price. Um, um, uh, I was going to then talk about technology, and I would say that you know, um, I saw it as two 
two parts. One part being um, power sector, one part being industry. And, and, and looking at Singapore's, at least Singapore's emissions pie, I would say um, if we can solve uh, power and can solve industry, then we would have addressed 85% of Singapore's emissions or that thereabouts. Um, on the power side, I think, unlike most other countries, uh, I think, as I said earlier, we can't deploy, you know, wind. We can deploy solar, but once you put solar on the, you know, on the on the floating platform, it will raise the cost. That is, that's unfortunately the, you know, the 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 the, the, the hand that Singapore has dealt with, the, the help cuts it was dealt with was just not so favorable because we just don't have the the space or the natural resources to do that. But I think uh, that said, um, our sense is even even if we look at higher costs, for example, um. Um, deploying solar on, on all sorts of platforms that we can, um, looking at looking at uh, uh, electricity imports, or maybe in the even longer term, looking at other solutions uh, uh, such as uh, hydrogen or maybe even nuclear if it's uh, going to be very, very, very safe. Um, I would say when you look at the whole, whole platform of things, there are clearer pathways for the power sector. I think what's less clear is the industry sector. And 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 um, I think we spoke about carbon capture being being expensive, uh, and and uh, I not not quite sure whether hydrogen can be deployed. But I would say that there is an added dimension in Singapore because let's just say we decide to move with carbon capture for Jurong Island, for which uh, there are plans to. So I think they are they are made public. I think they're called the Jurong Island Sustainable Plan or something like that. Uh, even after we capture the carbon and put pull it together. There's actually nowhere to put the carbon in Singapore. Right. Right. That's a real challenge for us. So the question is, who, which country is going to be willing to buy Singapore's carbon dioxide and store it in their uh, geological sites? That's that's the question that we haven't had an answer for. We, we we think it can be resolved because at the end of the day, if this is an economic transaction, then actually it's a matter of how much you know that carbon dioxide is going to cost uh, to, to be sold at. And if it makes economic sense, you know, uh, here we go. But um, my 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 bigger fear is when geopolitics creep in, uh, or when you know, um, the citizenry say, you know, I'm not gonna pay. I'm, I don't care how much you make from carbon from buying someone's carbon dioxide. It's just the wrong thing to do. You know, when when if that if it comes to that kind of points, then it becomes very difficult. And 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 that that is the yeah. challenge challenge you're facing. And I would say that that makes the difference between certain technology pathways versus others. I, I don't know whether I fully yeah. answered the question, but I hope yeah. I covered some. No, I think that's great, especially the, reinforcing the point that each country is unique and has different responsibilities. After all, Singapore is a city state uh, and doesn't have the same kind of resources uh, and land mass that other countries do. And that matters for each country's role. Uh, and I think really nicely, nicely put. Um, okay, sadly, we only have like 10 minutes left for what has just sparked a really fantastic conversation. I'm gonna to turn to two of the questions from the audience. There's actually a few uh, uh, there, but I, I'm gonna uh, refer to two. And the first one comes from uh, uh, Ishani Mukherjee, who you may know is a PhD graduate of our school and was involved very much and is involved very much in the whole policy design packages and mix approaches to the environment. So we're, um, Glad she's attending. And her question is, um, what potential contribution or role uh, can emerging second tier cities of the global south make or play, especially in the context of being guided by overarching smart city policy signals? Okay, so how do we think about these second tier cities um, that are not as advanced as Singapore? Um, and then the second uh, question, comes from, um, uh, I, I will tell you, it comes from uh, Thomas Mangieri, um, who asks, um, for small states like Singapore um, uh, that do not have sufficient space to implement renewable energy solutions at scale, just as was discussed, um, do you think that next generation and far safer nuclear power generation, such as, such as molten salt reactors uh, should be part of the solution to reduce CO2 emissions. So I'll stop there, two great questions and turn it over in the same order. So first to um, uh, Prof Navraz. Uh, great, thank you, thank you, Ben. Before, before I uh, uh, turn to those questions, I might just use the opportunity to 
clarify something that I think I, I probably didn't make very clear in response to, to something Mr. Heng said about, you know, the carbon tax and that four box diagram. And I just want to clarify that the intention is by no means to suggest that in a sense that a carbon tax is no longer helpful or, 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 or necessary. It's more to say that that diagram was meant to evoke the idea that one can also think in complementary ways about how you layer on policies and combinations to achieve further objectives. And the carbon tax might be a very good uh, sort of base of that, but that it could also be complemented by other things. So it was more that, that, that in fact, countries would be simultaneously in multiple of those boxes. It's not just a single box one would, would choose. I just want to get that, that out there. I think these are great questions. Um, and and I, I, I think uh, Angel will, will be able to speak better to the city's specific question, but I want to use that to make a broader point about the global south more generally. That I think the context the global south finds itself in, including cities in the global south, are that our emissions are growing. And I speak from the perspective of somebody who's, who, who has lived and, and continues to be very closely tied with India. And from the perspective of growing emissions, you're looking at the world very differently than if you're a Europe or perhaps even a Singapore, looking at how you decrease emissions. And it's not that the job is less important, it's arguably even more important because your task then, knowing that your emissions are gonna grow in the short run because you need more energy per capita, and at the moment, energy is closely tied to carbon, hopefully it won't be in under a decade, your task is to avoid locking into high carbon ways of developing, which means when you build long-standing infrastructure like buildings, like freight corridors, uh, like energy networks, think about how you're going to avoid locking into high carbon futures so that your future trajectory doesn't look like a mountain, but looks like a hill. And you want to basically squeeze the maximum development out per unit carbon. That's your task. So it's a different analytical question to saying, how do you decrease as rapidly as you can? No less important. In fact, in some ways more important because more of the world is grappling with that question about avoided emissions uh, in terms of population uh, than it is about reducing emissions. And so that general approach is what I would say uh, uh, really should inform much of what we're thinking about in the developing world. And that applies in particular uh, to cities where a lot of infrastructure is being built. And I'll maybe pass on the second question. If somebody else doesn't take it, I'll come back to it. Uh, but let me stop there. Okay, and before turning to Angel, just um, uh, uh, unfortunately we have six minutes left. So please um, do respond, but also be as pithy as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. And yeah, I will only touch on the first question and, and I'll leave the, the trickier one about nuclear to Mr. Hung. Um, I completely agree with what Navraz was saying. And actually, I just wrote a paper looking at the role of Chinese cities in uh, smart city initiatives. And so I'm happy to share that paper with you if you're interested. Um, it was presented at the Association for Asian Studies Conference last month. And so I think, yeah, exactly as Navraz said, I think a lot of cities, and so if you look at global smart city initiatives, um, 800 of them, so over half of the global smart city pilots are actually in China and coming from uh, many second tier cities in China as well. And so what we did in this paper is we looked at their 14 five-year plans. So the national government in China, they set their five-year plan in these, and so this latest one is from 2021 to 2025. And then some national governments, provinces and cities then have to develop their own five-year plans to say how they're actually going to implement their targets that they are given from the top level. And so what we did is we did a content analysis and look through to see how many of them are actually referring specifically to smart city approaches to address climate and energy goals. And most of them, them, a lot of them actually are looking at smart city initiatives in the mix of technology options to address climate and energy goals. And so focusing on smart city infrastructure and then also looking at the use of big data and big data initiatives and developing data centers to address climate change. So I think there's actually a huge role for cities, particularly in the global south, to help experiment and to innovate. This is part of that literature that we um, talked about in the IPCC chapters focused on cities of the role of cities to be able to really incubate a lot of these solutions and learn these lessons and then scale them up. And so I think there's, there's, there's a lot of potential there. Um, but I think it also goes back to Mr. Hung's comment about uh, needing to then decarbonize the electricity sector so that these smart city initiatives are not just adding to the problem of, uh, of, of climate change, but actually helping to decarbonize. So I'll just leave it there and, and turn to Mr. Hung um, to, to close us out. And maybe just add that there's a third question on electric vehicles in Singapore too. Perhaps you can reflect on that too when answering as well. Yeah, thanks. So I, I, I know that we're out of time, so I'll just talk about the 
the nuclear question and actually I replied to the to the to the uh, EV question uh, online already. Okay. Um, um, just on nuclear, I would say that it is something that we 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 must consider as an option. I I, I think it is uh, silly for Singapore to say never to nuclear, and I I don't think we'll ever take that position. But I think we are uh, quite cognizant that nuclear is not just one of technology, but also one of uh, uh, politics. So so um um I, I I wouldn't disclose which which country I spoke to, but I spoke to one of the ambassadors uh, just last week. And he was telling me that in his country, after Fukushima, um, it is just not possible to deploy nuclear. Uh, and, and, and I would say this simply reflects that um, any policy position that we take needs to take into account the politics of the day. So the question I think I would have to ask is, do we think Singaporeans are ready for nuclear to be deployed in Singapore? And, and, and I think it, the answer will change depending on how safe the technology becomes. So I would say at the current current uh, feasible technologies, I think nuclear is not likely to be something we'll deploy in the near term or maybe even medium term. But if you stretch it out to 2050 and beyond, I would say it is silly for us to not consider nuclear as an option to, 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 to think about. And really that's making sure we keep track of the, the nuclear technologies and the, and, the, and the development over time. I hope that that's clear. Thanks. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. And that does bring us, um... Uh, um, almost the end of our of our uh, uh, webinar series. So let me just close out uh, by saying to our audience and uh, that what you've heard today um, are three important perspectives on what has been a quarter century of efforts uh, designed to not just understand what's happening to the ecology of the planet and its reverberating effects on people. We must therefore adapt uh, to these natural processes, but also um, to policy innovation and policy design. And I think this is where the really exciting part of this panel uh, discussion went and where the report has gone. How do we now not just look at the evidence about what the science is telling us, but how do we plan to change the future uh, towards uh, decarbonization in ways that are consistent with the science but also go beyond to the policy uh, world. My favorite story of all time is the German government's feed and tariff program, uh, which was really the world's first effort to accelerate uh, the price of technologies that were green, that harnessed uh, the power of business, but also began with a regulatory spark about how to do that. And that program has been diffused to over 160 jurisdictions around the world, that kind of idea, that kind of program, including in Singapore. Uh, and so to me, then the ability of countries, including Singapore, to then use their innovative potential um, to deliberate in creative ways around these designs is where the action uh, lies. And I think these, these panels have shown that uh, quite nicely. So our time is now up. Uh, please join me in thanking our, our three uh, speakers uh, for uh, beginning a really important conversation and we look forward to at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Power Policy and our new Environment, Environment Sustainability Initiative to help you advance these conversations in Singapore, in ASEAN, and around uh, the globe. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.